Thank you for joining us for today's webinar. My name is Lisa Lichtrink and I'm working with the Health Worker for All Coalition Secretariat and I will be moderating today's webinar. Today we will be discussing the ongoing review of the relevance and effectiveness of the WHO Global Code of Practice on the International Recruitment of Health Personnel. Um, this webinar is actually the second in, uh, in a series of which the first one took place in August. And during that one, we focused on the different civil society perspectives. And for those interested, that recording can be found on the Health Worker for All Coalition's website. Today, we will hear from Ibeda Dillon at the WHO Health Workforce Department, as well as from Professor Francis Omaswa with the African Center for Global Health and Social Transformation. Uh, but before we get to that, just some quick housekeeping. Uh, today's webinar should be, uh, should last approximately one hour. Um, please mute yourself if you are not speaking. This is just to avoid any uh, background noise that can be uh, disturbing. Uh, this webinar will be recorded and will be available on our website and it will also be shared via email uh, for future reference. And we will have ample time for questions and discussion at the end, but questions can be raised at any time in our chat box. You can find that function in the control panel, uh, or you can raise your hand and pose your questions at the end. Clarifications I can raise during the speaker's time if necessary. Um, thank you also for those that filled in and submitted questions in the registration. I have taken note of them and will try to make sure that those are answered as well. Now, without further ado, I would like to briefly hand over to the Health Worker for All Coalition co-chair, Dr. Oluga, who is on the call, for a word of welcome. Dr. Oluga. Uh, thank you very much, Lisa, for uh, this uh, arrangement. Uh, and thank you also for all the members uh, of the coalition who are joining us on this webinar today. As Lisa has already mentioned, um, health worker migration is one of the core advocacy agenda for the Health Workers for All Coalition. And that means that we and the members of the coalition are very interested uh, in the movement of health workers across the world. And particularly for this webinar and the first webinar, we are very interested on the actions that are being taken in the review of the code of practice uh, for the WHO. And um, a month ago, myself and the co-chair, um, Amanda, we had um, a chat with the, the health workforce department at the WHO um, with um, Ibadan, who is, uh, we are very grateful to join us as a speaker today, uh, and also with Campbell. And um, Professor Francis Omaso has been uh, a member of the coalition, but also is in the expert advisory group. And we are very privileged to welcome both of them because they are long-term practitioners in the field of human resources for health. And we will be looking forward to the updates, specifically uh, on what we can do and also to engage our minds and also to learn from them on exactly what is going on and how we can participate, not just as uh, members of the coalition, but also as the coalition. So it is now my pleasure to welcome um, our speakers, uh, uh, starting with uh, uh, Mr. Ibadan from the WHO Health Workforce Department. Thank you and welcome. Thank you, Dr. Oluga. Um, before we give the floor to Ibadat, I had wanted to just recap our previous webinar. So I asked uh, Corinne uh, at Waymos Foundation to just give us a quick overview um, of our last webinar, just very brief for an introduction. Yes, thank you. Can you hear me? Yes, we can. Great, thank you. Yeah, uh, thank you, Lisa. Uh, just a very brief introduction uh, of this topic uh, in the greater scheme of things. Uh, as you all know, the WHO Code of Practice on the International Recruitment of Health Personnel was adopted in 2010. Uh, and it came with uh, quite an elaborate mechanism for rep reporting and review. 
it was agreed, for example, that a review of the code should take place every five years. So the first review took place in 2015 um, uh, during the World Health Assembly with all the preparations going on, of course, in 2014 already. So we are now five years later uh, and the expert advisory group that is tasked to perform this review, the second review, started its work in spring this year. And its results will then be uh, submitted to the 2020 World Health Assembly. So that's coming May. Uh, the previous webinar of the coalition took place in August, as Lisa mentioned, or uh, Dr. Oluga mentioned. And this was about the first meeting of the expert advisory group that took place in June in Geneva. Uh, I was lucky enough to attend part of that meeting, namely during the public hearing. And the meeting at that point discussed current global developments regarding health. So for example, the SDG agenda has of course changed the global landscape regarding health. Uh, it also touched upon the health workforce current developments like uh, the global strategy, the five-year action plan that have all been developed since the first review in 2015. And of course, it looked into health worker migration issues in particular and the current latest developments in that. Uh, I remember there was a lot of talk about the um, ever increasing number of bilateral agreements for health worker migration. And also uh, a lot of attention went to the list of countries with critical shortages. Uh, many, many other things, as you can imagine. I mean, it was a one and a half day meeting that I attended. Uh, and there were many speakers with many great evidence and studies on health worker migration and how this impacts uh, health systems. Um, so that's uh, too much to recap, but we addressed it in the previous webinar in August. Uh, and as Lisa mentioned, if you want to catch up uh, on the webinar, it's available on uh, the website of the coalition. But now, of course, we are uh, very uh, happy to hear about what happened during the second meeting of the expert advisory group, which took place one month ago at the end of October. Uh, and this was a closed meeting of the expert advisory group itself. Uh, not any outsiders were there. Um, so uh, giving back uh, the mic to uh, Lisa, I guess. Thank you. Thanks, Corinne, for that, for that quick overview. Um, yes, uh, just uh, now I would like to give the virtual floor to our first speaker, uh, or no, second, uh, Ibera Dillon, who is with the Health Workforce Department and closely involved with the code review and the expert advisory group from WHO site. Um, Ibera, can I give you the floor to just I'm, give us? Yeah, thank you, Lisa. I will, I will keep it short. Thank you, Dr. Luga, Corinne, Health Workers for All Coalition. Um, thank you for inviting us to give a little brief on on what's happening in the review of the WHO Global Code of Practice. Um, there were really three questions that you asked me to speak to, which mm -hmm. was who's on the expert advisory group, what's on the agenda, what was on the agenda, what are the issues being discussed, and the way forward. Um, so just to start, I think it's really important to recognize that the WHO Global Code of Practice, which was adopted in 2010, is widely recognized as the universal ethical standard for the international recruitment of health workers and the strengthening of health systems. And I'm sure some people in this webinar, including Professor Maswa, were intimately involved in the development of the code. The code is an extremely, uh, it is one of a handful of international legal instruments that are under the stewardship of WHO. It's also, it's very unique in its monitoring process and the fact that, an, that a UN instrument is going through a review of its relevance and effectiveness by an expert advisory group, including member states, is also very unusual. So just to give a little context on the process that we are in. So we are mandated to conduct this review of relevance and effectiveness periodically. Currently, we have uh, an expert advisory group. It's, it's made up, constituted of uh, 12 representatives from member states, two from every region. The previous two co-chairs who did the first review and eight independent uh, experts. 
uh, including Professor Omaswa and uh, other uh, specialists in the area. So the discussion really has been over the course of the two uh, meetings is fundamentally quite simple. What do we believe is the current relevance of the WHO Global Code of Practice? What can we say around the effectiveness of the WHO Global Code of Practice? And what are some key recommendations forward in relation to the instrument? So at its most simple form, the expert advisory group has been chewing on these questions. Uh, and through the two meetings, fundamentally what we've done is brought forward evidence that Corinne was saying on, the, on both the relevance and effectiveness of the code, um, bringing in the voices through the public hearing of uh, technical experts, uh, a lot of civil society groups, uh, including Ramos and others, um, the voice of the hospitals, uh, associations, the employers, um, and, the, and of the recruiters themselves. So this really has been something that is fundamentally uh, important and maybe is different from what we had in the past. Uh, so and I will come back to this. And similarly, we are bringing in evidence around, um, around an area that is growing in importance. We can clearly see an escalation in the migration of health workers uh, across borders. Uh, we can see the demand increasing across countries and especially so in uh, wealthy countries, whether it's uh, Europe, uh, you know, East Asia, uh, North America. Uh, and we can see that, uh, like Corinne said, we can see different forms of cooperation are being informed to us. That is, um, it may not be increasing in number, but it's, it's increasing in its reporting to us. Um, at the same time, we can see that the countries are, are reporting more and more to WHO on implementation of the code. So as of this moment, we have 110 countries that have submitted a national report on their, on their work to implement the code. Uh, and throughout the three rounds, this is something that has been strengthening. So this is positive. Uh, we have also, I think, thanks, thanks to Health Workers for All Coalition, we've also seen a small increase from the engagement of civil society reporting. So in the second round, we only had one report. And now we have uh, we received 14 reports, but I will come back to this again a little later. So on the agenda was to really try to make a sense of uh, these, these factors and issues that we are seeing uh, in the context of the code. And the issues discussed uh, really are around the relevance of the code, the effectiveness of the code, uh, and uh, the key recommendations forward. And I cannot go into the details of what the discussions are because this is very much for the expert group. But I think it's fair to say on the three issues that the relevance of the code is really seen as fundamentally important, uh, particularly so in the context of increasing migration, in the context of universal health coverage and the increasing, and the increasing importance of health workers to achieving universal health coverage across countries. Uh, and, uh, and, and in light of the adoption of the Global Compact of Safe, Orderly, and Regular Migration. So in all of these areas, the code, we are fortunate to have an instrument like the code. So I think this one, there's strong agreement on this topic. In the effectiveness, we can see from the first, second, and third round of code reporting that from the measurement uh, criteria in, that is included in the code itself on implementation of the code, we can clearly see progress from the last review of code relevance and effectiveness to now. So we have much more examples of the code being incorporated into national policy, into informing agreements. Um, but I think there's still a big question into, is the code reaching the potential that it has? And I think this has been a big area of discussion for the group that if we find the code to be relevant, but do we find that it has, uh, but does it, has it, have we done everything we can to make it as effective as possible? And I think this is the, the, the direction of the discussion that is ongoing in the expert advisory group. And the recommendations are fundamentally linked to this. And the rec recommendations, there are many different uh, perspectives and suggestions. But fundamental to them is the fact that we need to better implement the WHO Global Code of Practice. 
And that is, a, that is fundamentally a job for WHO, but it is not only the job for WHO. And so this is really important. And throughout the two uh, meetings, and, and thanks again to Wemos for its background paper uh, that we pr presented at the expert advisory group, uh, that it is not just uh, uh, the role of WHO, but that we really have to link much more strategically with non-state actors. And this includes civil society, but also professional associations and also really the international recruiters. And we had a couple of presentations from different recruiting agencies as well. Uh, so the, really we have to, in this next phase forward, once we've looked past these te first 10 years, that this is an area that we have to engage uh, more strategically. The issue of resources also has come up because if we are to do so, uh, we also have to be cognizant that there are resources required to support all of these activities. So that is in general the direction that we are going in. Uh, in terms of the process, the, the uh, expert advisory group's report is an agenda item at the forthcoming World Health Assembly next May. Uh, the document from the expert advisory group has to be ready by February. We envision that we will have a uh, you know, briefing on the expert ad advisory group uh, report once it's ready and publicly available. And this will be both to member states and also to civil society actors on, uh, on very much a, a report that is coming from the experts' uh, perspective. Uh, so that really is the way forward. And at least from the secretariat perspective, uh, we really see an opportunity from from this process to really uh, give momentum to the code in light of its uh, strong potential to deal with many of the fundamental issues that the world is uh, dealing with today. And maybe I will stop here and let uh, Professor Maswa give more detail from, because the report very much is the expert group's report. So I will take a step back and leave it to Professor Maswa to, to speak more on his perspectives on the two meetings. Good afternoon, everyone. Good afternoon, Professor. So I am in Kigali, Rwanda, attending a meeting of uh, um, WHO African Region, an advisory group, advisory group on health workforce. We haven't uh, been having something like this for some years, and we are celebrating the fact that the African region of WHO is able to convene us here to move forward on this important topic. I had invited them to join the uh, webinar, but the agenda is going slow. So uh, at a certain stage, I might take the computer there, but right now I've come out of the room because they are not yet ready, this agenda. And greetings from all of them. Okay then, so back to uh, the code itself and the review process. Uh, I am in the advisory group as an independent uh, expert. That's what the list says. But I am also uh, uh, very happy to feel that I'm representing uh, civil society organizations coming from Manchester. that's the name of the institution against which my name is, and uh, also that I come from Africa, one of the countries which has got uh, a number of issues on this topic. And my takeaway messages from the uh, work so far, including the meeting of October, are the following. <coughs> One, relevance of the code remains. In migration is increasing. Many of the migrant health workers are coming from the African region and other low-income countries. The demand of health workers from the rich countries is going to grow, <coughs> mainly because of demographic realities, uh, uh, aging population. So we really must uh, uh, I admit that this is an issue which is not going to go away. Look, for instance, in the 
United Kingdom of Great Britain. They are having uh, campaigns for elections, and one of the political parties has included recruiting 50,000 nurses as what they will do if they are elected. Where are those 50,000 going to come from? Certainly not from the UK. They are most likely going to come from the English-speaking uh, former colonies and so on, and that is a big issue for us. Then, too, <coughs> I was very pleased to, to, to hear a presentation from the German Ministry of Health in the October. Germany, uh, around that time, has decided to admit that they have a need to import health workers they have set up a department in the Ministry of Health to do this. They will set up satellite centers in the country sending health workers. They will also set up institutions inside Germany <coughs> to receive and orient health workers. That's really uh, a, a very powerful point for me on both relevance and effectiveness. And this German example is what I would really like to see uh, going forward. The uh, other point, the, the, our recruiters who made presentations, we also heard from uh, an immigrant, uh, a healthy migrant, a nurse, I think she's originally from India, but she has worked in Spain, the UK, and some other places. And her testimony is very powerful. In short, she, told us that uh, there are issues. <coughs> I've got a flu, so please excuse my coughing. Um, the, the reception and orientation which she gets when she goes to uh, the new countries, also the caution which uh, they take about her work, they are not sure how good she is, so there are a number of situations which make her uncomfortable. How her work is being <coughs> influenced by those suspicions. And uh, so that is also a trend which I would like to see being studied more. Um, the other one is resources. Our discussions uh, eventually uh, led to uh, agreeing that investment in health workforce globally is going down. When I was the executive director of the Global Health Workforce Alliance, uh, we had enough money in the alliance to give grants to the countries. Uh, but now the department there is struggling. In the Afro region, there are only two staff, and uh, uh, we need to emphasize the relevance of developing health workforce as a, a, an important uh, agenda in addressing health workforce migration. We also discussed uh, uh, um, the, the question of uh, thresholds. Uh, at the moment, the Global Health Workforce Strategy 2030 states that the ideal threshold is uh, uh, 4.45 physicians, nurses, and midwives <coughs> to a thousand population. But uh, we, particularly from developing countries, raised an issue with this because it, it does not compare like with like. We in Africa, a lot of our frontline health workers who interface with the uh, the public who need care are not physicians. They are clinical officers, medical assistants, pharmacy assistants, etc. And those are not taken into account when we discuss health workforce densities. Yet, not to do so is uh, a big flaw, and we cannot uh, allow it to go on like that. So, uh, we pushed very much that in future. The recommended densities should be about UHC trace, tracers and not just uh, 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 physicians, midwives, and nurses. It should be about addressing the 
basic QHC needs of uh, the populations. So I don't want to speak long, but uh, I think I've given you from my side uh, what I saw as the major inputs there. And for us, as uh, a civil society coalition, our job is to advocate and campaign for those issues which you have had me uh, address. One, resourcing for health workforce. Two, uh, addressing, uh, developing a, a fair and Represent a representative way of measuring uh, uh, health workforce densities. Uh, and then also the code African countries, the reporting is very poor, very, very poor. There was a little bit of improvement at the beginning, but um, awareness is not high. So we have a job to make the code uh, interesting and attractive to government so that we can uh, um, introduce stronger health workforce information systems, uh, labor markets, uh, or uh, accounts, which they will use in order to generate information for reporting. So that's what we are discussing here in Kigali, and I hope when we come to the next reporting, the inputs from here will make the African situation look better. So let me stop there for now, and uh, if there will be time to ask questions, I will be available to address them. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Professor Amaswa, and thank you, Ibadat, for giving us uh, that reflection. I think uh, with those two updates, we've uh, already covered definitely some of the issues that were raised in uh, in the registration form that, that I sent around uh, things around timelines, things around critical updates, uh, broad issues that were discussed. Um, maybe to start off the discussion, a question that came back in the registration form and that is also being raised by uh, Marika Hasse in the current uh, chat box, uh, is what role has the crisis countries from 2010, 2006, and is the review looking at the definition of a crisis country at the moment? It's a question to Ibadas at the moment. Uh, definitely, yes. I think we spent a lot of time in both the first and the second meeting to look at this issue of crisis countries. And definitely, I think there will be a recommendation coming out that will be linked into updating how we look at crisis countries. Uh, and I think going back to Professor Omaswa's point, uh, the idea of, you know, we will, there's an opportunity to reframe the thinking of this list as one that is purely focused on a regulatory uh, legal focus that you don't recruit from these countries to one that fundamentally says that these are countries that need, at first, the most important is to provide support for health workforce development in these countries because they're vulnerable. And, and safeguards uh, to be able to uh, manage that uh, workforce. So, so really there's an opportunity to revise the list, but also the, the use the conceptualization of the list at fundamentally linked to our big push towards universal health coverage. And I think Professor Omaswa alluded to this as well. Um, there's another question in the text box from uh, Dr. Oliga, uh, who is asking the possibility of WHO making public the bilateral agreements between countries for which health workers move to and from. I think this is something that uh, we have to discuss internally. Uh, we would like to. Uh, the challenge is that some of them have explicitly written on them, this is confidential. Mm -hmm. So in our reporting form, they are meant to make this public, but in the document itself, it says confidential. You know, so it is something that we have to, uh, we're still thinking through on how to do this. Uh, but I think hopefully we will find a way or at least do a subset of illustrative ones. All right, thank you. Uh, 
there's a question uh, from uh, Corinne, I believe. Um, you spoke to a briefing of some sort for member states and for non-state actors about the report that the expert advisory group will public publish and how and when will that take place? And can you elaborate a little bit on that? I'll let uh, Professor Omaswa jump in as well, but we envision yeah. one once the um, once the report is ready, and it is, I think our deadline is beginning of February to the to the to the assembly uh, process. Uh, then it will be following that, and before the uh, World Health Assembly, that we will have uh, informational sessions. Okay. So after that, after the report is ready and before the assembly, um, ideally it would be in the in March period, February period. But uh, yeah. Well, from what I remember, uh, what we are being advised is that this is a routine WHO process. Uh, this, this report, which the committee is producing, is for the Director General. It is going to go to the Executive Board of uh, the WHO, and then it will become an agenda item for the World Health Assembly. And at the time it becomes an agenda item, uh, there will be uh, uh, a report which normally <coughs> forms part of the agenda. Uh, but we also have this mechanism which we are using now to pick up uh, the contribution of uh, uh, civil society organizations and uh, your input from here and during the public hearing is going to be part of the report. Thank you. Um, there is another question from Dr. Oluga, but I may ask him to perhaps pose it himself instead of me reading it uh, out loud. Dr. Oluga? Yes. Hello? Go ahead, please. Uh, okay, so yes, so I, 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 during the 2017 November meeting in Dublin, um, the, the fourth uh, forum on HRH, mm -hmm. uh, there was a lot of discussion and consensus on the investment, uh, on, 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 on the case for uh, HRH being made an investment rather than an expenditure. Uh, but um, we have seen very little adoption of that language and also very little action uh, towards looking at health workforce or human resources for health as an investment. And I think the mentality and terminology that is still being used in many, many African countries, including uh, perhaps in Kenya where we are discussing wage bills, is that health workforce is still an expenditure. So I think this is pushing the African countries to perhaps stop investing in the health workforce and it is also leaving and I, I suppose also many other low-income countries and it is leaving thousands of doctors, nurses, midwives with no other option except to migrate because they are looking for greener pastures while WHO is still keeping the African countries on the list of countries with a crisis yet these countries are actually producing enough. So what I wanted the professor and also Ibadat to comment on is are there any specific strategies, whether uh, through the code, that can be adopted to make you know, um, these countries, as we review the code and as we look at um, uh, the issues of relevance and effectiveness, adopt this language and specifically also absorb their workforce so that then as we talk about migration and whether we can resource them, whether we can educate them, whether we can make sure that they are okay in those countries, that the African countries and also many other low-income countries are actually also absorbing these workers as a stopgap measure for migration. Thank you. I'll let okay uh, from my side. I think this is maybe the core of our department's work. 
Uh, we are really trying to make this case across countries uh, for the need to see it as an investment. And uh, we have colleagues actually who are in the wage bill discussions right now in Kenya and hopefully are saying the same message. Uh, and I think we also have to recognize that we are in many ways going in the opposite part, side of the stream where there's been 50 years of uh, advice where we've looked at uh, you know putting money for health workforce as an expenditure so this is this is the generally how it is seen but i think more and more we are seeing uh, language not just from who but also from the imf and now from the european investment bank where they're beginning to recognize that actually we have to put money into not just infrastructure but actually into the people who run the infrastructure. So I think this is definitely a core part of the strategy that we have to adopt going forward. And I think this is linked to Professor Maswa saying that we really have to think about the health workforce development and absorption in each country. Um, and uh, yeah, and the, the work that is happening right now, Afro is again, very, very valuable, but maybe Professor Maswa can speak more to this. Uh, okay. Uh, 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 Dr. Luca, there are two parts to your question. The first one would be referring to uh, the list of the so-called crisis countries because the code recommends that recruiters should not be going to recruit from these countries. At the same time, that is a study done uh, sort of more than 10 years ago and it was using uh, methods which are questioned. Uh, and uh, the, the, many of these countries use health workers more than they can employ and may want to have bilateral agreements to uh, send them to other parts of the world. So <coughs> this is being addressed, as we said before, by revising the criteria for classification of countries and even removing classification, just having an index which is based on a UHC tracer and which does not apply just to physicians, nurses, and midwives. So that's one. <coughs> then number two, regarding uh, health workforce as investment. This is going on. It is uh, well known from a number of studies now uh, that the health economy is one which contributes to economic growth. The employment <coughs> of health workers, particularly nurses and midwives, has many uh, extern positive externalities for the health economy. And that investing in not just health workers, but health is part and parcel of creating human capital, which is needed for economic growth. <coughs> so we are working on this, and uh, this is what the civil society group, the, 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 the health workers for all. Let's take this point. Let's advocate, spread it, so that it becomes the new norm. All right, there's a next question from uh, Rose in the chat box. Um, if uh, demand for health workers in rich countries is growing, um, they must sponsor educating these workers in the poor countries. Health workers who migrate, there should be a binding contract for say three to five years and come back home, so another group goes. This will help workers to be more exposed and become more experts and help their people as they come home. I think this is a more proposal uh, than a question per se, but is this type of thing being discussed? Uh, maybe, Francis, you can comment. Yes, that is uh, provided for in the code. So bilateral agreements between countries would provide for the circular uh, migrations so where uh, the sending country uh, decides that a set of uh, health workers will go 
for three to five years, <coughs> they come back and another set goes. So Uganda had an agreement like that with the at Trinidad and Tobago. But then the civil society group made so much noise. They said, Uganda, you don't have enough health workers. Why are you uh, sending uh, to other countries? And the whole thing was stopped. It was uh, formatted in that way. So it is uh, um, of the partnership agreement, bilateral agreement, which we should be promoting. Uh, maybe linking to that question, there's also another question that is asking what strategies are being promoted to address push factors from the poor countries. Um, I'm aware that in some African countries, newly trained health workers cannot obtain employment in the Ministry of Health. I think this is linked to Dr. Luga's comment about the investment in the health workforce. I think so much comes back to that. Yeah. Um, so I think this one for sure, I think we also have to recognize that in many places, uh, in many places around the world, they are probably dual markets. So you have a lot of expansion of private education that is explicitly looking at overseas markets. Um, and the people who are going to these have no intention of working, for example, in rural areas. So we also have to think about models where we are training for rural areas and then the example of you know the African example of the clinical officers the uh, advanced practice nurses and the pharmacists uh, those become increasingly relevant as we talk, talk about this subject sorry muted myself there for a second um... Then there's uh, a question from Brian Simpson, uh, and a question that I've also seen before in the in the registration is um, the low reporting that we see, especially from African countries. Is there a sense that that is because they don't see the code as being fit for purpose, or is it more an awareness issue? Maybe I will take a. Uh, stab at this and let Professor Maswa come in uh, with his perspective, but uh, I think where there's a push, countries report. So for example, in the Eastern Mediterranean region, there was uh, very little reporting in the first and second round, but in the third round, uh, 14 of 21 countries reported from the Eastern Mediterranean region, many of them who are in the middle of a lot of conflict. So for example, I, we received the report from Libya at the same moment that there was literally armies at the doors of Tripoli. So, so I think there's, uh, it's about the knowledge and the interest and the support for reporting. Uh, that has a big, uh, big impact. And we can see whether there's a concerted focus uh, on, uh, at a regional level uh, that there is strong reporting. Sierra is another example where nine of 11 countries uh, reported in the round. So you can see that if there's a push uh, and if the knowledge is made available, then actually the reporting itself is not a very burdensome process in and of itself. But I think it is, uh, but perhaps Professor Maswa has a different perspective. Professor, do you wish to comment? Can't seem to unmute him at this time. Um, but I have another, I have another question specifically posed to Francis. Um, talking about the example he raised from Germany, um, just asking for mo some more specifications. I understand that the number of bilateral agreements of Germany with Mexico, West African countries are increasing and those are actually seen as a more difficult issue. Uh, do you see these agreements as being framed well?
maybe I'll, if Professor Maswa doesn't jump in, maybe I'll jump in. I think uh, it's important to know that we have not seen the, these agreements from the Ministry of Health uh, yet, that the Ministry of Health is making with other uh, governments. But it's important to recognize that it's important that the Ministry of Health structure has itself changed to take into consideration the migration issue. And this is something we've seen in other places as well. And it's important because it puts, the, when the Ministry of Health discusses it, it of course discusses with another Ministry of Health. Oftentimes when these agreements are made, they're not, they don't include the health stakeholders. And so already I think the, the positive part about this is that the health system stakeholders are engaging with health system stakeholders. And hopefully because of this, that some of the concerns of the uh, country of origin uh, around the health systems can also be addressed through the cooperation that is advanced. So, so that is the positive part on this. Uh, and it's, uh, it's similar in other places as well. Thank you. Yeah, I think we seem to have lost Professor Amazwa, unfortunately. I'm hoping he will um, uh, join us again. Um, let me see. Uh, Dr. Liga, you posed another question, but I don't completely understand it. Please, can you um, uh, provide some explanation? Yes. Yes. yes um, I just wanted to ask the question about reporting. Um, Mr. Abdat had uh, mentioned that we currently have quite an improvement and we are having about 110 countries. So I wanted to ask the question, what do you consider a report from a country? Is it one that has come from the State Ministry of Health or um, reports from independent stakeholders are also counted as reports? And when reports come from the Ministry of Health, do you also request them to give you the bilateral agreements? Yes, so to the both questions, uh, first, yes, we have what we call a national reporting instrument. So when the process started, there was only the national reporting instrument that's coming from, from the government, largely from the Ministry of Health. And for this, we have 110 governments that have reported uh, to the code, which is uh, very important in, its, in and of itself. Uh, in the rounds two and three, we uh, opened up the reporting to get civil society perspective. And in the first one, it was only one report. In the second one, 14 reports. Um, but in the discussion from the EAG, there's really, uh, and I think building upon the documentation provided to us, there really is a, a serious think of how do we, as we think of the next 10 years or next five years of the code, how do we supplement the reporting from uh, the national parties uh, from with, with, with the perspectives of non-national stakeholders. Um, and, can, and can reporting from the non, and how can we strategically use reporting from the civil society actors to actually get the governments engaged in reporting? So for example, your report from Kenya, you know, how can that yes. link into the work of the Kenyan government? to actually feed us a report as well. And so I think there's, a, there's going to be a reflection. Uh, you know, we will not have the answer immediately, but definitely the expert advisory group is thinking very seriously about how the next two rounds of reporting should be different from what we've had so far and what we can do more strategically. And so I think your, as we come to the consultation from the expert group recommendations and the next steps, I think your guidance will also help us in, thinking about how do we use the reporting process more strategically. So I think that's the, yeah. But it's an important question. Thank you, thank you. Uh, I can see there is a question from Amanda uh, that I'm afraid I'm, I won't do justice by reading it out. Amanda, do you have space to uh, pose it yourself? Uh, yes, thank you. Um, I think, Partially, I think uh, the last uh, response from Eva that has touched on it. Um, there are two parts to the question. I think it's around um, how can WHO 
and uh, at country level that is uh, also interact with civil society at country level because I think from Professor Omatsu's um, comments and feedback and from what we know also from the the Health Worker for All Coalition is that there's a lack of awareness. And, and you also alluded to that uh, when you mentioned the case of Libya, that I guess it's interest and um, awareness about the code uh, by governments and also civil society at country level. So how can then um, WHO and maybe civil society work together at that level to encourage um, the reporting, but also to raise their awareness and, and, and um, pique the interest uh, so that's one part to the question. The second one is around, uh, you mentioned, I think, in response to Corinne's question around accessing the bilateral agreements that they are confidential. And so I find this also links to my first question in terms of then how can WHO and also working with civil society organizations at country level um, enable to, to uh, civil society to access these um, documents and, and um, yeah, to, to make it them um, not as transparent as they should be. Because I think the case of Uganda that uh, Professor Mansua alluded, uh, mentioned of um, Trinidad and Tobago and civil society must have been aware that there was this bilateral agreement, but how many more is, is going on and undercover that civil society are not aware that could react in the, in the perfect way that they did um, in Uganda to stop this. So it's just a question on the transparency and the role of WHO at country level and engaging with civil society at that level also to, to raise awareness, but also to make uh, information flow much better. No, I think this is a, this is a big uh, question and I think it's a big, it's a big part of the work uh, forward to try to get more transparency in the bilateral agreements but to recognize that this is not just something that is linked to the health worker agreements. This is linked to government to government agreements in general. You know, so there's a, this is something that uh, the governments hold as very uh, strong sovereignty on. So even WTO, ILO are trying to get, you know, more transparency in the reporting of these agreements. So we have an instrument where we are actually request identification of the agreements. Um, and there's a lot of work for us to actually distill the key points from these agreements into some sort of database. Uh, but these are, it takes resources and time to somehow uh, make it public in a way that is not, uh, uh, you know, divulging the confidential agreement that is made. Uh, because the agreements are really like apples and cherries and bananas and different things. Uh, so it's, a, it's something that we are thinking seriously. Uh, we are, uh, as part of our global public goods, over the next uh, year, two years, we are going to develop a guidebook on bilateral agreements that, again, hopefully will bring forward the key elements of these agreements uh, forward for civil society, for others to take forward. So that's, uh, that's something we're working on. But absolutely, I think making the, uh, these international agreements transparent is uh, is a big priority for across the international organizations, not just WHO. And across organizations is also a challenge. But I think we will, this is definitely something on our radar uh, for, the, for this coming period, that, that how do we do this in a, in a sensible manner. And it's tricky, for example, the Uganda example, you can see there's a different perspective between what you were saying on stopping that agreement and uh, you know professor maswa's perspective and others perspective that thought that given the unemployment in uganda and the opportunity for skills partnership that it actually was a good idea so these are uh, tricky uh, uh, yeah items but yes transparency overall i think it's, it's really fundamental Definitely, and I can see that uh, the the suggestion of having a guidebook is is well received uh, uh, by our members, also in the chat book. So I think that will be very welcomed, also probably for further contributions. Um, I'm looking at the time, uh, and I want to give uh, Michael uh, an opportunity to pose his question. Michael, are you able to speak? Please go ahead. Hello. You yes, can hear me? I can hear you. Thank you. Go ahead. Okay. Um, 
when you look at this analysis, most of the source countries are mainly in Africa. But one of the greatest challenges that we are having is the fact that most of this externalization of labor, especially among the health workers, the recruitment agencies are the ones that are fueling this pride. In other words, the South to North health work migration. So my question is, is there any kind of mechanism that has been established because we are so much talking about the bilateral agreements, but what about the existence of the recruitment agencies that are actually at a point of, you know, encouraging this kind of migration of the health workers? No, I think you're absolutely right. And I think the bilateral agreements are just a small part of the big picture. You know, so we cannot get uh, captured just by this. It's the, this was clear, 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 clear in our two meetings that how do we engage more with the recruitment agencies? We heard that from Sudan, that in Sudan, they used to have about a decade ago, they had about 10 recruitment agencies working and now they have 300. And so how do you uh, provide some ethical guidance and we've been working with, uh, I mean, we had a couple of very good presentations from a group in the US that's trying to do ethical recruitment, but with their code looking at the you know, practices amongst recruitment agencies. And what they can see is that the bigger companies are willing to go by more ethical standards, but that there are also lots of medium and small companies that is very difficult to control. Uh, so, I think one of the key areas of discussion is that while the code is very good at a global and at a governmental level, then how does the bottom up work around some of the other codes that are present for recruitment agencies uh, and, uh, and their business processes and their counterparts in source countries uh, match with the WHO global code? So I think this one is really, again, I think if I see the, the period of work in the next five to 10 years, uh, it will focus a lot on uh, non-state actors and trying to advance the ethical principles, not through just the government agencies and the bilateral government to government agreements, but really with a more deeper engagement with uh, uh, non-state actors, both public and private. But it's uh, completely recognized this is a big challenge. Thank you. Definitely, I think that's uh, that's something that's uh, that's broadly recognized in this group that that is uh, a challenge. Um, okay, I will take take the last two questions at once, and then um, looking to close. Uh, there's a question from Corinne asking sort of if gender issues in health worker and migration and bilateral agreements have been sort of discussed and considered in the last expert advisory group meeting. Um, and then Amanda is building on uh, a previous point. Um, can the Health Worker Coalition do with WHO prepare and build capacity of non-state actors and CSOs to provide independent reports? So those two questions and then uh, we'll, we'll close the meeting. Or Amanda, do you want to speak to it? Uh, yes, quickly. I think it's, uh, I think as an action point coming out of this uh, conversation, I think which is really great um, for the coalition and for WHO, um, just looking at uh, how we stay engaged uh, moving forward um, to, to, to support the, um, the current review, but also look ahead in the future. So I think one, one of the points that has come out uh, in, the, in the discussion today is the lack of awareness and maybe the capacity and I think there's also it seems willingness for others to to provide those sort of reports it's just that they don't know how and and what and and you but that you mentioned it's a, it's a very easy thing to do and also alluding to my earlier comments I find maybe this is something that we can try to to work towards um, an action point to build on how can we work with you in WHO to mobilize this awareness about the code I think now is also the right moment that people are more aware that this process is going on. What is it that we can do together to, to raise the profile of the code, but also to prepare and, and uh, build the capacity of non-state actors and civil society for future reporting? Is this something that WHO would consider to, to engage with us on? I think on that question, absolutely. I think this is, uh, and it's not just the independent reporting, it's about how can we support the implementation of the code now? 
Uh, you know, so it is uh, the reporting should be a byproduct. And I actually take back what I said earlier. Actually, you know, I were, as having worked in Tanzania for five years, reporting is not easy. <laughs> you know, no matter how simple an instrument, it still takes energy from a group that is already stretched. So, so that's uh, countering my own for <laughs> comment earlier. But uh, more importantly, I think we have to think about implementation of the code, not just reporting of the code. And so how can civil society, you know, and WHO together use the code as a means to say that we don't want to stop health worker migration, but how do we advance cooperation in a manner that does not compromise our health systems? And I think that's really fundamental and that code should be used by, for example, ministries of health as a, as a leveraging point. And where we have seen good practice, we can see the code being used by stakeholders in health systems to get into discussions that would otherwise take place between trade, labor, uh, immigration uh, agencies. So, so really it's a, manage, you know, it's a matter of empowering our health stakeholders to use the code in their dialogue with other stakeholders in the government. So that really is important and we could think about how do we do this uh, in an efficient manner. Uh, in terms of the gender and uh, bilateral agreements, um, I think the specific words, gender and bilateral agreements, never comes up. Um, and it's the same whether it's labor agreements, health worker migration related agreements, uh, trade agreements. Uh, it's throughout because fundamentally they're, it is, they're set up in a different way. The gender considerations related to health worker migration, they are huge. You know, so when we're talking about nurse agreements and nurse recruitment and social security benefits, I think these are really important issues. Uh, again, that needs uh, much more work. Um, and I think I have colleagues that are working on this uh, area. But it's, uh, yeah, but I would say it's not just the bilateral agreement text, because here you will go to thousands of trade agreements that will not have the word gender. But the impact on gender is important from not just the agreements, but actually from the mobility flows. So I think I will stop there. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Ibadat. Um, yes, I'm, I'm looking to close the meeting. I think, uh, thank you for this very engaging discussion. Thank you for our speakers to offering our, their time. Uh, on the timeline, just to clarify, Ibadat, you said that the report will likely be ready in February. Is that right? Yes, the beginning of February, and we have to submit to our governance process where they will edit it and clean it, and then it will be published online before the assembly. I, su I suspect that once the text is ready, that we probably can start with the uh, briefings on the report of the expert advisory group, but this is something I have to check. So that's why it is the period between uh, February and May, really, and hopefully February, April, March, where we're looking at, uh, you know, engaging more stakeholders around the report. Perfect. As you probably have gathered, this is yeah. something of very uh, high interest to this group. So. Uh... We look forward to being up to date on, on that as well. Um, before I hand over to Dr. Oluga to close the meeting, I just wanted to quickly raise that I can see that there's a num there were a number of people on the call today that are not yet members of the Health Workers Referral Coalition. So if you wish to get more involved, know more, please reach out via the email that I, you can see on the screen, welcome at healthworkersreferralscoalition.org. We can give you more information on how to get more involved. Um, Dr. Oluga. Could you kindly close the webinar? Okay, uh, thank you very much, um, uh, Ibadat. Uh, thank you very much for being uh, very informative, very insightful, and also being very helpful to all the participants, uh, our members, and specifically also for welcoming the participation of the Health Workers for All Coalition. As we mentioned with the call um, between myself, you, uh, Mr. Campbell, and Amanda, that the coalition is very interested in engaging more formally uh, with WHO on all matters that relate to, to the health workforce and, and specifically uh, the issue of health worker migration and the court specifically is of, of a lot of interest as at now. And we want to look forward to um, engaging in the public hearings, but also engaging in um, some partnership, um, whether it's to do advocacy or to capacity build civil societies who may be members of the coalition or even who are not members of the coalition 
or to create more awareness uh, for countries to also um, help in implementation of the code, to develop the guidebook that, that we really took as a key uh, uh, part of this discussion. So I want to thank you very much. Also want to thank uh, Professor Omaswa. Uh, he has been quite uh, very close to all of us. He is our internal resource and um, we know that he's a member of the expert advisory group as an independent member and he's still also a member of the coalition uh, from uh, the group HS. We want to thank all the participants in this uh, talk and as we continue to discuss this more, we hope that we will develop a healthcare system that supports the needs of the people that need healthcare the most all over the world. Thank you, Lisa, for the wonderful host and goodbye to everyone. Thank you. Thank you Dr. Luca. Have a good evening. Thank you. Ashkuru sana or something. Thank you.